alaykum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh Welcome to the live faith book A special show tonight, inshallah Previously we were discussing theological arguments and discussion from the book Haqq al-Yaqeen During uh, Muharram and Arba'in season We looked at Kamil ziyarat And we looked at different hadiths uh, attaining to going for ziyarah Last week the celebration started with Farhat al-Zahra And the celebrations continue, alhamdulillah With the birth of two of the greatest personalities in Islam on one we have Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, the seal of the prophets, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's greatest and first creation. And on the other we have Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salam, the sixth Imam, who excelled in science and academia and who our theological school is named after. Inshallah we'll discuss these two great personalities and more with their biographies with my guest and host and my teacher. Sheikh Muhammad Abbas Banju. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikhna. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah wa asadala ayamana wa ayamakum wa yakdi Allah hawa ijana wa hawa ijakum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase our happiness on this great occasion of uh, the birth of two grand personalities. And uh, by their Sheikh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfill the hajat. All the mu'minin and the mu'minat, may we get to do the ziyar of Rasulullah in the dunya inshallah. and gain his shafa'ah in the akhirah. Inshallah. And inshallah, we live to see the day where we have a massive golden qubba over the grave of Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad as-Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi, the master of this madhab. Inshallah, inshallah. Shaykh, now. Before we begin, <coughs> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, known as probably the greatest mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on mankind, a man of many traits and many characteristics. Um, can we discuss one characteristic that you feel really, really stands out from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? Of course. Uh, this is perhaps one of the most difficult tasks. Um, how do you even summarize? the traits of an individual whose traits in itself, in its entirety, cannot be understood. You need to be able to understand the great context, a great concept in order to be able to summarize it. We cannot even understand the greatness of um, the character of Rasulullah and hence summarizing it in essence is very difficult. Hakikatan, every character and trait of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam is a trait that needs to be studied. And every character of his is volumes and volumes of writings. And this is without any exaggeration. You find the manner in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces Rasulullah within the Quran and describes Rasulullah within the Quran. Wa ma arsalnaka bismillahir rahmanir rahim. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We do not send you except that you are a mercy. Not only towards mankind, لِلْعَالَمِينَ Everything within the realm of creation, Ya Rasulullah, you are a mercy for them. Hence, the message is a message of mercy. The character and the personality of Rasulullah is one of mercy. And he calls towards mercy on behalf or representing the creator of the universe who is a creator of mercy. From the character of Rasulullah, one and every character stands out. But one that I want to talk about today is the character of determination. MashaAllah. And uh, in reality, when you read the biography of Rasulullah, You'll find that this is perhaps a nukta muhimma. This is an important point for our viewers, for myself, for yourself. Believers, brothers and sisters, researchers of Islam. What primary sources do we return back to when we want to study and understand the life of Rasulullah? That's a very good question actually. This is something very important. As mm -hmm. a scholar, as a researcher, leave that as a believer. Enter which primary sources do you go back to in order to understand your prophet, life of the prophet? Which primary resources do you go back to 
through which you are able to understand the characters and the personality of your prophet. From all the books of history that we have out there, books of history from the Amma and the Khassa, Hadith of Ahlul Bayt, for example, you find that one important source, Masdar, authentic, primary source of the Prophet's biography, a book through which you are able to understand the character of the Prophet and the struggles of the Prophet, Habib Sayyid Muhsin, the Quran. The Quran in itself, through the Quran, you are able to understand the characters, you are able to understand the struggles of the Holy Prophet in a manner in which no other historian is able to capture. Outside of Ahlul Bayt, you find that there is no other pure source in regards to understanding the character of the Holy Prophet. So this is an important point that I wanted to have Bain al Kawsain. The determination of Rasulullah, you find that much as that he was a man of mercy and he came to preach the message of Tawheed mm -hmm. and he had. He was at the peak of morals and the peak of morality. I was sent in order not only to be of good morals but to perfect Indeed. this concept of morality. You find within all this, the Prophet was generous, the Prophet was uh, forgiving, the Prophet had foresight, the Prophet was courageous. From all these traits, determination. And when you look at the struggles and the challenges that Rasulullah went through, one thing that stands out is his determination to not be intimidated, to not be discouraged, to not be disheartened from the opinions of the people around him to not be intimidated by oppression, to not be intimidated by violence while standing up for the message of Haq. And you find over here that Rasulullah was a subject to a number of attacks. And when the Prophet came to declare his message, there was just about every attack and every type of arrow that can be perceived within an armor to attack Rasulullah, every arrow perceivable was used. Not only did they come out in physical war against him, as we see towards the second half of Risala mm -hmm. when the Holy Prophet migrated to Medina, like the battles of Ahad and Badr and Khandak and so on and so forth, all of which were wars of Self-defense. You find that this is another misconception that, you know, many people are of the opinion that the Prophet was a prophet of bloodshed, was a prophet of war, and that he expanded his territory through war. However, if you were to look at even the geographic locations of the wars, you would find that the Kofar, had actually traveled great distances. A lot of the wars happened in close proximity of Medina, whereas mm -hmm. the Kufar have traveled from Makkah. Mm -hmm. That shows yes. us the force of the aggressor is the mm -hmm. one who made the distance, is the one who embarked upon the journey and took the initiative to mobilize forces and attack Rasulullah. Majority of the wars were in and around, the major wars were in and around the city of Medina which in itself, the geographical locations of the war in itself is the greatest indicator that Rasulullah was engaged in nothing more than a defensive war. And even within that de defensive war, there were preventive measures, not only to avoid the bloodshed, but to minimize the bloodshed. And within this, you have from the speeches and the words of Rasulullah, the sermons delivered by Rasulullah, you find that an entire protocol, an entire constitution of the etiquette of war is outlined. Indeed. 
the highest level of non-violence within a violent setting. I remember reading up uh, that there was one in regards to like even the, the nature around. Uh, you're not allowed to cut down trees. And, and, and simple things like that, which, which I mean, obviously are not are neglected by today's war standards. Not only neglected by today's war standards, but I have yet to see a military code of conduct which obliges commanders or officers on the ground to not damage or to not uh, destroy the plants or the trees. This is something that is unseen. Mm -hmm. Aslan, when it comes to calculating collateral damage, the environment is never taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. The only government to have done that was the government of Rasulullah and the government of Abir al Mu'minin mm -hmm. salam. And uh, so you find that Rasulullah, as we were saying, was subject to a number of attacks. Not only was he subject to war, but you find that even before he moved to Medina, in the city of Mecca, he was subject to a financial embargo. Yes. I mean, you look at the opposition and the manners in which the Kufar and the Mushrikeen fought against Rasulullah. Number one, warfare. Open warfare. This is when he had established mm -hmm. the state in Medina. Before that, in Mecca, he was subjected to a financial embargo where they were forced mm -hmm. into the Sha'ib, into the valley, valley of, of Abu, Abu Talib. Talib. Yeah. In this day and age, the equivalent of a financial embargo, mm -hmm. restrictions placed on them, trade restrictions, Indeed. so on and so forth, sanctions. Yes. The word that I was looking for is it's sanctions. Sanctions, yes. sanctions in terms of trade, not only trade, sanctions in terms well. of, I'm sorry? Dialogue. You weren't even allowed to conversate. You, are, no, you were not allowed to have a conversation. They would not even marry you. Yes. They were refused and they stopped. They would not give their sons or take your daughters or anything of the sort. Sanctions to its maximum, mm -hmm. which eventually led to the martyrdom of Ummul Mu'minin, Sayyidina Khadija, yes. alayhi yes. And in addition to this, physical oppression, there was the psychological oppression on the Rasulullah and the insults that he had to bear and Siddiq sometimes the trauma and the psychological abuse mm -hmm. that a person has to endure is much more painful than physical wounds mm -hmm. and you find that the Quran is filled with all these verses where if we contemplate in the right way, mm. it gives us an idea, a glimpse of the oppression and the hardships that Rasulullah was subject to. If you look into the Quran, by way of example, you have in Surah at tur verse number 29, I believe. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Fadhakir. فَمَا أَنْتَ بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ بِكَاهِنٍ وَلَا مَجْنُونَ When Rasulullah came forward with the message of Islam and the shahada la ilaha illallah, you find that one of the reactions of the people is when the Prophet would go out to preach within the streets of Mecca, they would insult him yes. by calling him insane. Mm -hmm. Yani deranged, yani de delirious. Yes. And, you know, try and put this in, in today's day and age when you are trying to guide people, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you are going about doing your work and to be black sheeped within the community, to be ostracized for the community mm -hmm. and for your character to be put at disrepute in the most vulgar of manners. Such that they would call him mentally deranged. If one person called you mentally deranged. And this is because you are trying to guide him. Yeah. You are trying to gain salvation for him. Mm. You are going to help him. And the person who is the recipient of your help instead of gratitude turns around and insults you in the worst way possible. Take a moment to think about this. If somebody was to say this to you, you would probably not want to see him again probably not want to speak with him again and you can imagine an entire community against you mm -hmm. not once not twice day in day out but yet you find 
Rasulullah was steadfast to the extent that, and this is the point that I want to touch on, determination. The Mushrikeen of Makkah sent a message to Sayyiduna Abu Talib, Salamullahi alayhi, pious believer in Allah and in the message of Rasulullah. They said to him, Ya Abu Talib, tell your nephew whatever he wants because after all the abuse and ostracizing him and character assassination, they saw the determination of Rasulullah mm. is firm. He is not willing to budge. Yes. So they said they would try to bribe him. <laughs> so they went to Abu Talib and they said to him, tell your nephew this message that he has come up with he is causing chaos within the community. The slaves are rebelling against the masters, mm -hmm. the wives against their husbands, and children against their parents. Families were split. Communities were split. I, th I think the main issue was actually the money as well. The business was really affected with this new religion coming in. Business was affected. A lot of money, a lot of money. Baba, the unity of the mushrikeen <laughs> was shattered in Makkah. Indeed. You said your message is divisive. It's dividing people. They said to Abu Talib, tell him, what does he want? Does he want wealth? We will make him from the richest of the, the richest of the richest kings that Arabia has ever seen. Does he want women? We will marry him to multiple women of the most beautiful women Arabia has ever seen. What does he want? Tell him. Between the bribes, and between this persecution and being ostracized and the psychological trauma and abuse and character assassination, Rasulullah himself one man. And he says these eternal words to Abu Talib alayhi salam that history has recorded. Even if they placed the sun in my right hand, and the moon in my left hand, I shall not retract from this message until Allah makes this message the dominant message or I perish while trying to make it the dominant message. Determination, firm in the, in the face of difficulties, in the face of hardships. And Waqian, this is a lesson for, for myself and for all Muslims, all believers, yes. non-Muslims, characters on personal development and character building of how a person needs to remain firm in his belief during times of difficulty. Hassan, mashallah, Shaykh, mashallah. Shaykh, even at times of difficulty, let's be honest, uh, and I'll talk for myself, you know, it can get very, very difficult to endure patience, to keep your head in the right place. Most importantly, to have the right conduct and akhlaq. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi always showed the best of akhlaq. Can you give us some examples of, of, of his akhlaq and then how his akhlaq actually won the hearts of many? Of course. Akhlaq in terms of morality and behavior is a very wide subject. And there are a number of avenues to touch. But one aspect is the aspect of clemency. Mercy of Rasulullah, clemency. Okay. His ability and his willingness to forgive and not punish. Awesome. And this aspect of clemency from the character of Rasulullah is not only to be understood in terms of personal relationships, but it actually sets a precedent even in the field of Governance and politics. And I give you an example. We have within the seerah of Rasulullah that from the people who had converted to Islam, not everyone was genuine in their conversions. And you had a lot of those who were hypocrites and hence the revelation of Surah <laughs> Ahsantum, the Surah of the Hypocrites. We have within history that there was a companion by the name of Ubaidullah ibn Ubay. And he was probably 
the head of all hypocrites, master of hypocrites, in terms of damaging the reputation of Rasulullah, jeopardizing the message of Rasulullah. In one of the defensive wars that Rasulullah is traveling outside of Medina to protect the city and to protect the, the citizens of the state, while they are mobilizing themselves for this defensive war, Ubayy bin Abdullah ibn Ubayy utters certain sentences and creates a scene while the Islamic country is going to defend its borders from an external threat. As a result of the actions and the words of this individual, Abdullah ibn Ubay, a number of the Muslims formed a rebellion and broke away from the army. They returned back to Medina to not defend the frontiers and defend the state. Mm. In this day and age, Sayyid Mohsin, think about it. Treason. Treason. Imagine that you have a division of the army which is traveling to its borders to protect its borders yes, so it's from defensive. potential it's terrorist attacks. It's defensive, not even an attack. It's you're defending. You are defending mm -hmm. the borders of your country from terrorist attacks. And as you are doing that, you have a military officer or a commander who stands up and forms a rebellion as a result of which a part of the contingency of the army of the country which is defending the borders against terrorist acts, a part of that army refuses to go to the forefront. Like a mutiny, rebellion from within. How would the country, how would the laws of the country, how would the head of state or the judiciary deal with such a person? This person who has called a, who's caused a rebellion and a division within an army and retracted from their duty of defending the country's borders against terrorists, such an officer or a commander would straight away be taken for a court martial and would most probably be imprisoned for life for treason against the country if not executed, death state uh, or death penalty. Definitely. Not in the government of Rasulullah. Because clemency, mercy, is not only a part of your personal akhlaq. Mercy is the ethos within the constitution of the government. Mercy is an ethos encompassed within the military code of conduct. The seerah says, Rasulullah came back from the defensive war. He didn't even take Abdullah ibn Ubay to task. No questioning, no court martial, no house arrest, no imprisonment, nothing. MashaAllah, Shaykh. Inshallah, we'll continue this discussion after the break. We're going to go on a short break, but please join us after the break as we continue this, this great story of the great personality of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Join us after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Welcome back to the live Facebook where we're discussing on this auspicious occasion uh, personalities and characteristics of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And also, inshallah, we'll move our conversation on to Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, inshallah. Shaykhna, before the break, we were discussing uh, 
Abdullah ibn Ubay and his uh, mutiny, you could say, uh, against uh, the military of uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa A very important and critical time of defending uh, the, the state of Medina. Please continue. Ahsantu. So the idea being the enemy from within and such an offense of such a magnitude, treason against a country, Indeed. particularly at a sensitive time where the country Indeed. is defending itself against terrorist attacks. During that time, you have a commander or a cadet within the army who causes a mutiny. According to today's law and judicial practices, such a person would be court-martialed. He would deserve either life imprisonment or the death penalty at execution. But you find that Rasulullah's government was different. And this is the point that we are trying to put forward for our viewers when it comes to understanding Rasulullah. This clemency and this mercy, number one, was just not a slogan. It was the essential character of Rasulullah. And number two, this clemency and this mercy was incorporated as a primary ethos within the constitution of the government, including the military constitution. And Sarahatan, to be honest and to be very frank with you, we live in a world today in the 21st century that lacks mercy and clemency. Be it from the developed nations to the western states, be it Islamic states. Definitely. And we live at a time where being known as an Islamic state by name does no service. We don't need countries to claim that they are Islamic. We need countries that are Islamic in action, whose constitutions and whose laws for themselves speak out Islam. We like this. Rather, what happens is when a country claims to be Islamic, claims to be a country that promotes the teachings of Rasulullah, and then does the contrary, what happens is that Islam gets a negative image. Rasulullah gets a negative Indeed. image. It is the greatest disservice that can be done to Rasulullah. Better to not have an Islamic government or to be known as an Islamic government in that sense. And hence, this is what the world needs. Number one, to understand Rasulullah through the light of mercy and clemency and the constitution of governments that claim to be Islamic. Today we live at a time where people are, exe are executed or given life imprisonment. Islamic countries mm -hmm. enter open the map of the world one by one, one by one. Countries that claim to be Islamic without oh, any exemption. Go and see how many prisoners are there, political prisoners. Oh, plenty. Yes. Life imprisonment, executions, sanctions, house arrest for those who have a different political opinion. I mean, even if you look at the UN, um, you know, in terms of human rights violations, I think if, if, you know, if the viewers would go and have a look at how many Islamic countries have human rights violations, you'll be shocked at the numbers, especially these who claim to follow Rasulullah ah, sallallahu Look at this is the litmus test. Political prisoners for, for verbally expressing your opinion. Look at the standard Rasulullah has set for somebody who performs a mutiny in such a sensitive situation. He does not deserve imprisonment. Then what about the person who verbally expressed himself? Where is Islam? Where is Rasulullah? The real celebration of Miladun Nabi is actualized by us implementing the teachings of Rasulullah and the character within Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi wa sallam. You find, before we move on, this is an important thing to take home from 
the character of Rasulullah, from the words of Rasulullah. Every saying of Rasulullah is Jameel, but there is one saying of Rasulullah where he says, and this is taken from the book Kalimatur Rasulul A'adam. We mentioned oh, this before, book yes. during the Sayyid Hassan of Rasulullah. Shahid Hassan al Shirazi, Rahmatullah uh, Alayhi, the late uh, assassinated brother of uh, the current Marja, Ayatollah al Udma, Sayyid Sadiq al Shirazi. He states this one narration of Rasulullah. Ida amila ahadukum amalan faliyatkinuh. If any one of you embarks upon a certain task, upon a certain job, then he should perfect that job. Mm. When you do something, do something with full perfection. If you're going to embark upon a task, do not take that task if you're not going to completely, if you're not going to complete it perfectly. In every job that you do, aim for perfection. And these are deep words from Rasulullah that could change the entire Islamic Ummah. Indeed. Everyone, if you're going to recite Majlis, recite the best of Majalis. Practice and research and ensure your presentation is at the peak of its presentation, perfection. If you are going to be a presenter on TV, if you are going to be running a channel, Islamic channel, do things and aim for perfection. Don't aim for half-baked jobs. I try, I try so much. <laughs> I don't mean to you, but I'm saying in general, by way of example, Indeed. in terms of religion, in terms of non-religion, if I'm going to recite Salat, aim to recite the best of Salat. If I'm going to do Hajj, the best of Hajj. If I'm going to do Ziyarah, the best of Ziyarah. Do not settle for anything that is half. If I'm going to run a Husayniya, if I'm going to run a community center, don't just run the community center of the Husayniya for the sake of running it. Aim for perfection within this. If I'm going to be an engineer, study in the best way and give a contribution in its perfection. Do not be half professional. Do not be quarter professional. Do not look to cut corners. Aim for perfection. And I think this is an important message from the many messages that we can take from the teachings and the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. it feels as if you know, the message of Rasulullah fell on deaf ears, except for the Japanese. Because I know the Japanese are very, very well known for perfection. They, everything they do in, in uh, their... Even when it comes to just writing, when they write on a piece of paper, they take a lot of honour and pride in, in, in their awesome. work. And I think, mashallah, they must have heard the message. And <laughs> we got left behind, unfortunately. Inshallah. We use these days to motivate each other, inshallah. Inshallah. To implement, be familiar with the teachings of Rasulullah and implement them in our lives. Mashallah. Inshallah. Shaykhna, let's move our discussion on to the second personality who was also born on the same day as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Um, Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salam, the son of uh, the great Imam Muhammad Bakr alayhi salam. Now Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salam, as we know from you know studying his biography and also listening to Majalis, we always hear about his contribution towards education, his contribution towards the sciences. Our school of thought is known and a uh, school of fiqh is known as the Jafri school of fiqh um, and so forth. But Imam Sadiq at, the, at his time it was very difficult with the government. I mean, the Umayyads were still in power and there was a shift in power. There was a battle between the Abbasids and the Umayyads. Um, and on top of that, obviously, there was constant threat to Imam Sadiq salam. And on top of that, Imam Sadiq is meant to be a source of guidance and a source of knowledge, running this university which had thousands of students. I mean, how was, was it, you know, how did he manage to do such a thing? And also, most, most importantly, to his Shia, what did he instruct, what advice did he give in dealing with such a government and dealing with tyrants uh, at such a critical and crucial time where the, the Shia academia, you could say, flourished and, and, and excelled? It's a very good question and it's a very detailed question. Um, the life and the aspects of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Uh, first and foremost, without doubt that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa, alayhi wa sallam is Ashraf al-Bakhluqat, the best of all creations. 
and much as weight is given on celebrating uh, the life of Rasulullah during these days, we should not abandon, neither should we belittle Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq uh, from our celebrations, from our speeches, from our gatherings. It is not by coincidence that both these great personalities were born on the same day, 17th of Rabi'ul Awwal. Yani there is a hikma ilahiya. Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq, the reviver of the pure original teachings of Rasulullah, <laughs> master of this faith, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Had it not been for the Imam, the true religion and the true message of Rasulullah would have been obliterated. The times in which he was, uh, uh, the times that in which he was living and conducting the duties of his Imama, as you mentioned. Imam al-Sadiq was active in every field of knowledge perceivable to man. Theology, medicine, literature, arts, architecture, chemistry, chemistry physics. physics, biology, ani. And this is a research, inshallah, that with the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, Insha'Allah, it will be made public. There is not a single contemporary science. There is not a single contemporary science today in the 21st century, except that Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad as Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayh, master of the faith, has spoken about it. Contemporary, be it finance, be it investments, be it anything, DNA, whatever you want to think about. Any science your mind can come up with, you find that Imam Sadiq has spoken about it. Mentioned it in terms of its establishment, in terms of its roots, in Some, terms of its foundations. Sometimes even its existence as well. well. Its existence. Mm -hmm. A number of sciences were discovered because of the yeah, initial words of Imam mm -hmm. Sadiq. And you find that within all this, Imam Sadiq was not silent when it came to politics. Even within the field of politics and the social responsibility, governance, the civil duty of the people when it comes to dealing with a tyrant or a tyrannical government, Imam Sadiq was not quiet. One of the greatest forms of jihad is to speak the words of truth during times of oppression mm -hmm. or during, in the face of a tyrant. And you find over here that Imam al-Sadiq rallied people to open rebellion against Bani Umayyah. And Imam al-Sadiq did this very eloquently and very fearlessly. And the purity of his intentions in this went and penetrated the hearts of the believers, which is why he was perceived as a threat to Bani Umayyah and the message of Imam al-Hussein in general. You have this one incident again, I've taken it again from the book of Shahid Hassan al-Shirazi, Ayatollah Rahmatullah Alayh, and the title of the book is Kalimatul Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam in this encyclopedia of the words and the sayings and the teachings of Imam al-Sadiq. For Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, if I'm not mistaken with the publication that I have, three volume book. Mashallah. The narration is by Ali ibn Abi Hamza, one of the companions of Imam al-Sadiq. He says, I used to have a friend who used to work within the administrative department of Bani Umayyah. He was from amongst the Qutab. So you could say he was working in basic admin, secretarial position, mm -hmm. or as a postman, where he would just transcribe the communications and so on and so forth. And he says, this friend of mine came and he asked permission to visit Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. And it seems that he was from the Shia or from those who sympathize with the Shia. He comes to Imam Sadiq alayhi salam and he says, I did the salam and I sat in front of Imam Sadiq. And I said to him, Imam Sadiq, 
I work for Bani Umayyah, but I'm not involved in any crimes. Mm -hmm. I don't lift any any weapons. I'm not mm -hmm. involved in any executions. I'm not involved in any theft, the suppression and the oppression of the farmers and the people of the villages. I'm not involved in any of that. My job is strictly admin and secretarial. Only I type the not type. I write <laughs> the letters and what would be seen today <laughs> as in Ahsanto. He says. Is my rizq halal? Is my livelihood and my income halal? And this issue of halal income is absolutely important in this day and age. Indeed. The professions that we choose. Mm -hmm. And I, Yared, you know, if this was a part of every student's in, uh, induction, you know, when you have careers there, yes. within our madrasas, within our local centers, community centers, when you're having seminars on prepping students on what career path to take and what sciences to study. Mm. But some of the careers that our youth are choosing, some of the careers that our elders are in, yani, some of them openly haram. Examples. Examples we'll leave for now. <laughs> but haram. A person mm. needs to be involved and needs to know what is the halal and the haram of the job or the mm. career that he wants to pursue. Every field has halal and haram. Mm. Whether you want to be a doctor, you want to be a surgeon, and you have masail that revolve around this. And as a doctor, can you be, as a doctor, I don't want any answers or anything. I'm just asking rhetorically, and the viewers have to be aware of this. Mm -hmm. And as a doctor, are you allowed Islamically? A patient comes to you and says they want an abortion. No. What are you supposed to do in this situation? Yeah. Well, as a doctor, they come and they tell you we want to turn off the life support machi machine, for mm -hmm. example. In the field of investments, for example, buying shares in companies or buying shares within a portfolio where certain companies are known to be investing, for example, in goods or services that are not halal. Mm -hmm. How does all this work yes. in this sense? Taking interest from a government bank that is Muslim or a non-government bank which is also Muslim or a non-Muslim bank, so on and so forth. All these questions are out there, whatever field in which you are. Baba, can you increase a direct debit, for example, amount without having informed your customer that you're increasing the direct debit mm. amount by an X amount of pounds or dollars? Subhanallah, the list is endless. Indeed, yes. In any case, this person comes and says to Imam Sadiq, is my risk halal? Look at the answer of Imam Sadiq. Let me read for you what he says. Law anna bani umayya, lawla anna, lawla anna bani umayya wajadu man yaktub lahum, wa yujbi lahum alfi. وَيُقَاتِلْ عَنْهُمْ وَيَشْحَدْ جَمَاعَتَهُمْ لَمَا سَلَبُونَ حَقَّنَا He said, had Bani Umayyah, had they not have, had they not had people who would work as administrators for them, had they not had employees who would go out collecting illegitimate and illegal taxes on their behalf, had they not found people who are willing to be employed within their militaries and their armies, had they not had people who would go and recite Salatul Jama'ah behind them, they would not have had the audacity to usurp us of our rights. You say, Bani Umayya, Bani Umayya is who? Individuals, a clan, a group of people, a number of people. Who empowered these people and laid the foundation for them to then become a dynasty that would rule over maybe one third of the known earth. The general masses who acted as sheep and put their own personal agendas and their personal benefit in front of the benefit of the deen. It is people like you because Bani Umayyah is able to find employees like you. Mm. That they used you as tools to gain control and Satan over the Islamic Ummah. 
Look at the answer of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. This person became shocked. He said, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, what should I do? How do I come out from this? Yani, dhahiran, the risk is not halal. He says, Ju'il to fidak. Yani, we understand from this, he was Shia. He says, may I be sacrificed for you? He says, what is the way out? How come? Go back and tell Bani Umar. What do I do? Look at what Imam Sadiq says. And what we said in regards to Rasulullah, determination. Mm -hmm. Determination to be determined to make a change in your life. He says, in If I tell you what the hal or what the solution is, are you really ready? Are you prepared to follow my instructions? Mm -hmm. You should call it afal. It was determined there and then. Baba, my akhirah is more important than my dunya. Imam al-Sadiq said to him, go back home and remove your accounts for each and every penny. I'm paraphrasing the rest of the incident for the sake of time. Remove your accounts and account for each and every penny, dime, that you have taken from Bani Umayyah. And go and return it back to whom you have taken. And if you don't remember who you took money from, go and give it out as sadaqah. Cleanse your wealth and everything you possess from this source of income. Ali ibn Hamza says, I went with the person. Ali ibn Abi Hamza says, I went with the person. And he removed everything from his house. He, the house in which he only gave back that house. Liquidated everything that he had. Wow. Ali ibn Abi Hamza says this person to the extent that his clothes that were on his body. Removed them naked. Ali ibn Abi Hamza says we went and we gave him food. We gave, went and we gave him clothes so he has something to cover his privacy mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. He implemented the words of Imam al -Sadiq. The narration goes on to say couple of months and the person was afflicted with a sickness and from this sickness he passed away Ali bin Abi Hamza went and he said to Imam al Sadiq this person who you had given such and such guidance to has passed <coughs> and the Imam smiled and said to him he has entered into Jannah pure Look at the timing of the incidences. Mm -hmm. Look at, there are a number of stories from this. The importance of rizq halal. The importance of making sure you are not an instrument within the forces and the structures of tyranny and oppression against Ahlul Bayt. Determination to earn rizq that is halal and confidence and loyalty and submission when it comes to implementing the words of Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad as-Sadiq salawatullahi wa salamahu alayh may Allah azza wa jal never tribulate any one of us with the risk that is haram and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the grace of Imam Sadiq and the grace of Rasulullah increase in our risk, risk which is halal risk through which we are able to cater for our families, risk through which we are able to progress in the dunya as well as the akhirah and serve Islam insha'Allah. The Eid Mubarak again to you and to all our respected viewers, mu'min and mu'minat. Awesome. Thank you very much, Sheikh, for tonight's <coughs> discussion. And thank you for all the viewers for joining us. Insha'Allah, it was very, very beneficial for yourself. And insha'Allah, please enjoy and continue the celebration. And do not forget the Imam of our time and the Imam of your time in your du'as. Insha'Allah, see you next week on another episode of the live Facebook. Insha'Allah, we'll discuss um, arguments from the theological discussion. Insha'Allah. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.